Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Paul Sweeney, along with Tom Keen. Join us each day for insight from the best in economics, geopolitics, finance, and investment. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. Visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show. Weekday mornings from 7 to 10 Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And as always, on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App. Let's check in with a professional here, Seema Shah, Senior Global Investment Strategist at Principal Global Investor. Seema, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Love to get your take from what we heard from Fed Chairman Jay Powell yesterday. Thanks for having me on. Well, I think the big thing, the big takeaway was really that the Fed wants to cut rates. Um, It's not a case of, you know, going through the inflation data. There may be a little bit of a hesitancy, but certainly Powell seemed to be somewhat dismissive of those upside inflation surprises. You know, he put it down to seasonality. So I think the the big takeaway is is that the Fed wants to cut rates. They need a really good reason not to cut rates. Um, So from that perspective, it looks like three cuts are on their way for this year. And where are you penciling in those cuts? Are we seeing those in June, July, as soon as May? So we have been, uh, we've had a a forecast for a while for the first cut to come in June, uh, followed by September and December. So this is fairly in line, I think, with where the market is pricing today, although I think the market is maybe starting to price in even more cuts um, than, than before. So maybe some expectation that May could be there. But certainly for us, I think, even though Powell was quite dovish, I would actually go so far as to call him dovish rather than hawkish, um, he, they, you still need to have some clear evidence that inflation has abated and that those two months of Jan and February anomalies rather than a new rising trend. Seema, uh, I guess in a little bit less than an hour, we're going to hear from the Bank of England. What do you expect uh, to hear from the BOE? Well, that's an interesting one because, so, of course, it, very unlikely to have any kind of change to policy. I think that that, that is certainly uh, the full expectation for the market. The narrative is interesting at the moment because it's quite different to the US, where the UK is really struggling. Uh, the economy has been much, much weaker than the US and the inflation numbers, the latest one coming in uh, a little bit lower than expected. So they have a clear path. Um, to cuts now. And certainly from our perspective, there is a rising chance that that you get them sooner rather than later, potentially as soon as June, Um, which, you know, if you do have a number of central banks moving at the same time, that will make things life easier um, for for each other and certainly for the currency markets. So should we still expect the Fed to be leading the way in terms of central banks, at least in developed markets, making those uh, decisions to cut rates? So I think it will be coincidental, to be honest. I think for the ECB and the Bank of England, their fundamentals of their economies really are calling for rate cuts um, in the very near future. So if the Fed didn't cut in June, I don't think that's a reason to stop for the ECB and the Bank of England to put off their rate cuts, um, certainly. But it just so happens, I think, in a way that the Fed is probably going to be cutting around the same time. And I think their meeting does come first, so they will be leading the way. Um, generally speaking, though, you know, the U.S. does have a very, very different picture to what you're seeing from Europe and the U.K., which is why for yesterday's meeting, that was somewhat dovish. I mean, you have a strong growth picture. I mean, stronger. They, they raise their, their forecast quite considerably for this year. You've got a higher inflation forecast, and yet you've still got rate cuts coming at the same time as um, other countries, other economies around the world, which are pretty much in stagnation, if not already in recession. All right, Seema, so for the U.S. market here, if we are, in fact, in a reasonably dovish situation from the Fed's perspective, what are you telling your clients to do here in the U.S. in terms of maybe asset allocation? Yeah, look, this is this is a risk on time. OK, um, we have been uh, overweighting equities and credit for the last couple of months in the expectation that the economy, we expect it to slow a little bit, but certainly to avoid recession. But we've also been anticipating the rate cuts and together that soft landing with rate cuts is a perfect situation um, for equities and credit. Now, importantly for equities, this is also going to be a time where you can start to really look at the very unloved parts of the market, the bits where the valuations are still quite attractive, of which there are many. So within the US, although we do still like that large cap tech space, um, we are edging into that small cap space. Uh, we think that that should do well. The valuation gap is fairly significant, and we think it could close up uh, a little bit over the coming months. And then there's other parts of the world. 
Uh, if you look across the Latin American valuations, they are very interesting. Their fundamentals are pretty strong. The political scene is is um, a little bit less volatile than it was previously. Uh, so there are pockets around the world, but actually our favoured um, region is still the US. And as I said, we're looking a little bit more at small cap. Yeah, I was going to say the Russell 2000 is still down 15% from that 2021 high. Is that, to your point, an opportunity or is there any type of concern that the market is still being very much driven by those mega cap technology companies? I would say that both those things that you just said are opportunities. You know, the value, the fact that the um, the small cap space hasn't performed as well, uh, there's a bit of a catch up trade within there. And although the big cap um, have done very well, as I said, we're not really pulling back our exposure there. Uh, just it's driving the market, but there is a movement that if you can really get this cyclical upturn, which is certainly what Powell's pointing to, uh, that should be very good news. Historically, when the Fed has been cutting and it's been uh, in, even if it's a very, very gentle expansion, that has typically been when small caps have outperformed. So uh, there are, of course, risks. Uh, you know, if the Fed is going to end up delaying its rate cuts to later in the year, then small caps would struggle, at least in the near term. Uh, so we have to go into it with a slightly longer term perspective, knowing that in the next three to four months, you could see some significant volatility. But if you're looking out over a nine one year horizon, nine month, one year horizon, uh, then it looks fairly attractive. See, in the fixed income space, do I just stay with the U.S. Treasury market or would I try to take on some credit risk here? What are you suggesting? Uh, we should be taking on credit risk. Okay. We have actually gone overweight to the high yield space. It has done incredibly well. Uh, and if you're just looking at carry, if you just compare it even to equity risk premiums, uh, high yield and IG um, are really presenting a fairly attractive proposition. Now, there have been concerns, of course, about the maturity wall. Uh, we know that that is building up. It's going to be um, probably one of, one of the most significant maturity wells that we've seen in recent, recent history. But the important thing is there is that as long as the economic backdrop is still very constructive, um, then really we're not expecting any kind of major liquidity issues. We're not expecting managers to struggle. They will have to refinance at higher rates, but their balance sheets are pretty strong. Um, and importantly as well, that maturity will, even within the high yield space, it's biased towards higher quality. So we're still saying high quality within the high yield. We're not really looking at the triple Cs or um, that space, but there are still a lot of opportunities within that credit, as long as you agree with us that there is an economic expansion in play and the Fed is going to be cutting rates over the coming months. All right, Seema, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate getting some of your thoughts here today. Seema Shah, she's a senior global investment strategist at Principal Global Investors. <music> Billy, back in the day when I was on the sell side, I'd hop on the train at the drop of a hat to go down to Baltimore because you had to go see T. Rowe Price. That was a huge II vote, which I'll have you know, I, I got the II vote 20 years straight out of those clowns down there. Love the T. Rowe Price. Some super smart people down there, man. All my clients down there uh, were very smart. You had to bring your A game. Sebastian Page joins us here. He's head of global multi-asset and he's the CIO at our good friends at T. Rowe Price down in Baltimore. Sebastian, we heard from the Fed yesterday uh, looks like they were a little bit more maybe dovish than some people had been thinking going into that meeting. We heard from the Bank of England just moments ago, again, perhaps a little bit more dovish than they had been. So it feels like global central banks are becoming you know, more accommodative. How does that fit in with your world? Yeah, that's a great question. And first, uh, this is my first time in the studio. Super exciting. Nice. Thank you for the introduction for coming in. to Baltimore. Love it. We are nice with the sell side. Sometimes people refer to us as T-Row nice. And just for, <laughs> for the record, I want to say we're not clowns. We're, we're serious There's investors. There's smart folks down there. I, it's interesting that you ask about both the Fed and the Bank of England. And we just had a decision yeah. by the Bank of England. I look at the policy rates, they're about the same, you know, five and a quarter, five and a half percent. Then I compare wage growth. So Atlanta Fed tracker for wage growth in the US is at 5%. I go to England, it's at 6%. Service inflation, services in England is at 6%. So we're looking at, I think, greater inflation pressures in England than in the US, even though the policy rates are the same. And I was just talking to our European economists, and he's also worried about impending further inflation on the goods side for England. Because, you know, it's, it's an importing country, and the Red Sea is shut down in terms of a shipping lane. Yep. 
So costs for shipping are increasing. So, you know, I, I don't know. Everyone's bringing rates down. I'm worried about inflation. We're worried about upside risks to inflation. And so if inflation stays hot, the Fed, in theory, drags their feet. We see cuts either extend out longer. Where are you putting money to work if that plays out and that is the case? Because right now I'm looking at NASDAQ 100 mini futures are up almost 1% today. Yeah, let me give you three trades if you want to think about upside risk and inflation. Mm -hmm. Number one in bonds, you know, go short duration. We're short duration, we have a cash overweight and a credit overweight. Really? Okay. It's not a massive position mm -hmm. for us, but we're short duration. Number two, in stocks, you have value versus growth. In the value universe, you have energy stocks that are sensitive to inflation, and I think that overall value is poised to outperform growth, especially because growth has rallied so much, if we get upside surprises in inflation going forward. And I'm not talking about going back to 9% that we had. I'm just talking about inflation above expectations, the consensus that it's really coming down smoothly which is not. And the third trade we have in our portfolios is real asset equities. That's a diversified portfolio of stocks, including energy stocks, metals and mining, metals and REITs. Really? So you get a position there that gives you over time some equity exposure as opposed to just going into tips. And that responds to inflation in a kind of like four or five X response to the surprise, whereas tips would be more one to one. So it's a higher octane kind of inflation hmm. hedge. On a global scale, because I know you're head of global multi-asset at T. Rowe Price, where globally do you see some of the best opportunities? Because I think I've been hearing more and more people talk about emerging markets. And I'm always a little concerned about that because isn't China like a third of the MSCI? And I even invest in China? So how do you think about the global allocation? So globally, we're neutral between stocks outside the U.S. and the U.S. The U.S. is clearly the strongest economy, but a lot of this is already priced in. Look, we have raging debates in our asset allocation committee about <laughs> China because we've had an overweight emerging markets. We like to lean against the wind. We like to be long asset classes when they're really stretched, really cheap, and everybody's on the other side of the boat. If you do that over time, you can do well. But right now, it's a huge debate about yep. China. And you know, those that are worried about China are ta on my committee are talking about structural changes. This is not the same place to invest as it was in the past. Nonetheless, you're so stretched there. It's like a coiled spring. You could see a rally. You, you could definitely yep. see a rally. So, you know, you try to stay close to neutral again there. Looking at the U.S. market, uh, NVIDIA is up another 2% <laughs> today. It's up 82% year to date. Supermicro is up 215%. Meta is up 43%. Two questions. One, what are you doing with this whole momentum trade and how far how much further can we extend and secondly i look at the micron earnings they're going to have their best day in 13 years and they're up to 18 percent on ai growth so like can they keep going further with the fact that sales are smashing expectations look i love that question because i'm working on this with the research team this week I'm writing a note for our internal research platform with a cute title that is, do you have FOMO on the MOMO because of YOLO? Oh, I think no. that, <laughs> That's got it all, I, just, right? I, I thought about this for you. I know it's gonna be on the show. You're, you're in the media game, you want talking points. Here's the counterintuitive conclusion that we're finding. Momentum is working better than it's ever worked. I have data going back to early 1990s, even data going back further. It's never worked that well. You can, if you look back 12, 16 months, you would, here's a, here's a dumb strategy, okay? You could just rank the stocks in the S&P 500 by trailing 12 month returns, mm -hmm. pick the top 10, hold them for a month, repeat. Okay, if markets are efficient, Finance professors will tell you this should not work. Well, in history, it's never worked that well. So maybe not so dumb a strategy. Now, when do we get worried about momentum? And that's why our conclusions are counterintuitive. We're not that worried about it, even though it's extreme. Because it wasn't extreme before the last three bear markets. 
when momentum is in its stop quintile, the forward return for stocks is an average of 14%. Yep. Now there's a, yep. big, there's a big caveat there, which is there's a fat tail, which is 2000, when we had the mother of all momentum crashes. But the difference between that momentum crash and the situation we're in right now is that the situation we're in right now, momentum stocks are supported by fundamentals. There's huge yep. momentum mm -hmm. in fundamentals. So quality and momentum are moving together. They're both performing well. If you do an autopsy of the 2000 bubble, yep. it was junk stocks, non-earners right. yep. with momentum. Yeah, that was, so, that was my bellywick back in the day. I took those companies public, but now we got real companies, real cash flow. Sebastian, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate you being in studio here. Sebastian Page, he's head of global multi-asset and he's the CIO at T. Rowe Price. <music> Brianne Lynch joins us. She's head of market insight at Equities End. So Brianne, it looks like, I'm just looking at Astera Labs, its performance uh, yesterday, Reddit today. What do you make of this uh, IPO market these days? I think that many of the companies that have been waiting to IPO hopefully see a stare and say, oh, my okay. okay, this is a good sign. This is a good sign that the market may be right for us. Obviously, Estera Labs, given that it's in the semiconductor space and they're catering to cloud computing and AI technologies, they're able to kind of, you know, capitalize on the investor demand there. Um, and, and I think it kind of brings back to what a lot of companies will be thinking. How do I make AI a part of my story? And we've seen that with Reddit too, talking about how data licensing to language learning models will be a big part of their future revenue opportunity. Uh, so certainly a very different company than Estera Labs, but an interesting one that I think will be a little volatile to watch today. Yeah, that whole aspect of Reddit that Bailey's been reporting on uh, about this data aspect to it and getting some kind of AI play into that story, I'm not sure I buy it. What do you think, Brianne? Is that is that a reasonable pitch? Is that a reasonable reason to take a look at this company, Reddit? It's not a guaranteed revenue driver. We saw, you know, even this past week, the FTC is investigating what data they actually share with these um, partners they have, you know, is, is it okay that they share that? If they were to have a cease and assist where they can no longer share this data, that would be a big problem in terms of their future growth opportunity because, you know, they've seen their ad revenue grow 20%, not a number that's exciting a lot of investors. The real bull case is on this data licensing opportunity. So if there's something that hinders that, uh, you know, it makes the story a little less desirable. And Brian, this is a deal that was marketed at 31 to 34 bucks, pricing at 34 seemed like there would be some divide when I talked to venture capitalists and investors on valuation and valuation expectations. What's your read of it pricing at the top of the range? Yeah, the price at the top of the range obviously, you know, gives some sense that there is strong investor demand for this company. We haven't seen a social media platform go public since Pinterest back in 2019. So perhaps there's some pent up demand there. Um, but when you look at Reddit versus some of its public comps, it's a smaller player um, and it's not profitable. So it doesn't have, you know, this perfect story for those looking to invest in the next, you know, emerging social media company. And um, to the fact of emerging, this is a 19 year old company. It's been around for a long time. And, uh, you know, question with a lot of these private companies is how much growth is left because they've grown so much in the private markets. Brianna, are you surprised that we haven't seen better, more IPO activity over the past, I don't know, six to nine to 12 months? I mean, we have stock market indexes at or near all time highs. What's the what's the problem here? Yeah, I think all the macro indicators would suggest that the market has been or should have been welcoming into IPOs. Uh, but we saw with kind of the Clavio, Instacart, Arm group that went public this fall, they had lackluster IPOs. That being said, Arm is now trading at double its IPO price. So another one that's really, um, you know, capitalized on this demand for the AI market. 
Um, Astera Labs, I think, will be a good indicator for the market. Um, and it's more of a pure tech play than Reddit. So if I'm a private tech company considering my options, maybe my business looks more like Astera than it looks like Reddit. And that makes me feel good about <laughs> the opportunities in the market. Um, but we're hearing from you know the heads of NYSE and NASDAQ that they had these deep pipelines of companies that are preparing to go public. And really there's a finite period of time that they'll likely do that, um, you know, given the election coming up later this year, the volatility that could come with that. So I think if Reddit has decent performance, it will certainly um, encourage others to follow if Estera alone doesn't do that. Brianna, at what point do we see private equity backed companies going public again? We saw Brightspring and Amr with its own kind of different flavors within investors and holdings. Uh, are we going to see companies kind of or management teams just really ripping off the bandaid and going public? Yeah, I think it depends on kind of, you know, what the story is. And if it's something that they think will appeal to public market investors, you know, Birkenstock, you know, is a private equity backed company uh, went public last year um, along the same time as, you know, Instacart and those others um, performed OK, but not great. Um, so I think, you know, similarly, those companies are sitting on the sidelines. The difference there is that those investors le have less likely held those investments for 10, 15 years and maybe have a little bit more leeway in terms of holding in the private markets versus an early stage investor who at this point is very eager to, you know, sell that investment and return capital to LPs and invest in new things. So uh, the pressure dynamic there for liquidity is a little different. Brianna, I was looking through your notes here today. One data point you provided really jumped out at me. The percentage of public companies has dropped 35% since the mid 1980s when I got my start, while the percentage of private companies has jumped by 43% over the time period, same time period. Wow, so I mean, that just shows you kind of how the capital markets have changed. I can stay private longer uh, I guess, then maybe trying to get the public market. So is anything there going to change, do you think? I think that's a dynamic that's not going to change anytime soon. There's just an abundance of capital available in the private markets more so than ever before. I think the companies that will feel the pressure to go public are these late stage companies that have already raised a ton of venture capital. They have a lot of pressure from those early investors and shareholders for liquidity those are likely going to be the ones to go public in the near future. But to your point, if I'm a three, four, five-year-old private company um, who can raise plenty of capital at the earlier stages in the private markets, I don't have to you know, disclose all my financials. I have a little bit more privacy almost <laughs> like as I'm growing through this phase, I don't have the daily mark to marks that for a lot of companies sounds like a better position to be in. So I think companies will continue to stay private in those early mid years uh, and look to go public later in their life cycles than they did 10, 15 years ago. What's your what are your expectations for deal flow and IPO volumes in 2024? Because when I talk to bankers, it still feels like the year 2025 keeps coming up. Yeah, I think that a lot rides on these early IPOs and how well they do. There are certainly plenty of companies who want to IPO or are feeling the pressure to IPO, but they are a little nervous to rip off the Band-Aid. And last year's IPOs didn't really you know, give them the boost of confidence that they needed to do that. So I don't think we are. We're certainly not going to see a 2020, 2021 year, but maybe we see a more normal IPO year than we did last year. You know, when you look at this year already, proceeds are up 169% versus last year, deal counts up 15%. So the, the, Spigot, I guess, is widening a bit. There's more flow happening. Um, so I think, you know, having a normal year versus a blockbuster year or an extremely quiet year is probably the right thing for the market now. Brianne, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate getting uh, your comments and your insights there. Brianne Lynch. All right, your daily look at the front pages around the world. Lisa Mateo, what do you see in the newspapers this morning that got your attention? All right, we're starting with the New York Times. They're saying New York City schools are dealing with a spike in problems 
from kids. They're not behaving that well. A lot of the issues are those lower level disturbances. Educators are saying, though, students are still having a hard time emotionally after the pandemic. So that's what they're mm. relating it to. They're saying kids are having trouble talking things out. So now they're hitting, they're fighting. Um, so you have those kind of issues. They have um, issue um, from the police department. It says last school year, there were more than 14,000 school safety incidents. But if you compare that to 2018, 2019, before the pandemic, there were just over 11,000. So they're saying kids are getting mm. frustrated. They don't know how to deal with their emotions because that's what the pandemic turned them toward. So uh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the issue. Yeah, that's there. a year and a half of homeschooling it's and all that remote learning. Bent and all up that. frustration, yeah. I guess, uh, maybe. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can't pay these teachers enough is my simple takeaway. Yeah, no, it's care. tough. And especially as a parent myself, like knowing when the kids came home, what these teachers have to deal with yep. because the parents were turned into teachers yep. in a way at that point too. Yeah, thank goodness that's behind us. Okay, yes. what else we got? Uh, so we're talking about couples meeting on Discord, not the average dating app. This is not a dating app. This is Discord, okay? So what Discord is, it draws in about 200 million monthly users, really? but it detra it's an online community. So it's like people with hobbies, they share similar interests. So they go on and they form these groups. It could be anything like astronomy fans, you know, fantasy football fans, anything like that. Yeah. So instead of, you know, using the apps that swipe, swipe left are we and right, swipe, are, do we they're swipe not on swiping. No, they're going okay. on here. They're going into these groups and in those groups, that's where they find their mate, their love interests. So really? it's kind of like thinking about the modern version, you know how like we used to go to the bar or go wherever exactly. and, and meet that's people not, and talk I to people. Still do that, still works fine. <laughs> but instead me. of going into the bar, you're going into these online communities. And that's how they're starting to meet people. So I've I don't never, know. I've I never mean, heard of Discord, I have to admit. It's kind of like a competitor to Reddit. It was one of the things that yeah. the, the youth were uh, hanging out in during the pandemic. Okay. I think the fascinating thing on the story, though, long-distance relationship between Stuttgart, yes. Germany, and Birmingham, Alabama. Yes. <laughs> they're doing it via video conferencing. And that couple, actually, they met each other's parents, but they, they travel together. They still live oh apart. <laughs> They're trying to make it work, but I don't know. I, I, I mean, you're getting married pretty soon, Bailey. I'm getting I mean, married soon. Did I did you not. Meet on an app? No, no, we no? met at Syracuse the old-fashioned way. Okay, you know? okay. <laughs> Syracuse. Well, some of those are leading to engagements, okay. um, which leads me to my next story. This is about the Zale, the owner of Zales, you know, Jared Jewelers, um, Signet Jewelers saying that sub couples are waiting to get engaged this year. That's because of what we've been talking about, you know, inflation and certain labor market. It's pushing their to, you know, say yes dates back a little bit, um, which is a turnaround for the company because they were saying that engagements would rise this year. But now they're kind of doing a little about huh. face. They're saying, well, actually, no, <laughs> that's not going to happen. And so still yeah. the engagement ring, that hasn't changed, right? Is yeah, that, that still That hasn't a thing? changed. It's just how many people are going to buy them this year. So and Zales is big, easy. right? Yeah. I mean, I think they're like one yes. of the Zales and K Jewelers too. That's their other that's their other one. Uh, so they own they own all of that. K Jewelers and Zales, yes. That's signature. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So but the in number of engagements, it's recovering. They had this like dry dating spell during the pandemic. A lot of people went through that. But two point one million couples became in, engaged last year, but it's still the lowest in, in a number of years. Really? So we'll see. I don't know. You no, know, I got engaged during <laughs> so, the pandemic. But so you, you got engaged during like, the pandemic. You got engaged during the pandemic. During the pandemic. <laughs> September 2022, I think. Okay, yeah. that's kind of the end of the uh, yeah. I guess, yeah, life was kind of normal. I forget when, when we timestamp these things. I just think, you know, I just, for me, it was once you got the vaccination, done. Move on. <laughs> yeah. on they made me come back to work and ride the subway every day, so I figured that's got to be the yeah, end of it. Yeah, that, that's, that's an indication right there. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. All right, what's, All a, right. what's a crookie? So a crookie, you remember the cronut? It was yeah, like, like the five big, minutes, yeah. the big phase in New York. No one could get them. You waited on these lines forever. They sold out. So now you have the crookie. It's this new pastry from France. It was from of Paris. Course. It's a mashup between a croissant and a cookie. So some uh, have yeah, yeah, the yeah. cookie in the croissant. Some have the cookie you know, surrounding the croissant. It's all these kind of different ways, but there's a place in the city that have Janie's Life-Changing Baked Goods. Okay, they have three locations. They sell for $7.50 each, wow. so it's a big so it's like thing. A course, yeah. But they're selling out within hours. I mean, at this place, they own, they're they only offered on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays. That's it. So and, people yeah. line up. They can't get them. There's another place, set of Pani's. That's another place where you can get these. But it's just the hot new craze. I guess people are bored and they just want something different. I, I, I don't know. We were we were in the city, uh, in the East Village, over the weekend for a friend's birthday doing a, a pizza tour. And I was, <laughs> the amount of places you walk by where you're just like, only in Manhattan would people wait in line for 45 minutes to buy a $9 coffee. Right. I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm not... <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I I'm don't not get a believer. it. I guess I it's know. just to post a picture on Instagram. Yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> and again, where did you get this story? This was the New York yeah, Post. Uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> bing, bing. <laughs> All right. Good stuff. Lisa Mateo, thank you so much. We appreciate it here. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast, bringing you the best in economics, geopolitics, finance, and investment. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. Visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show. Weekday mornings from 7 to 10 Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And as always, on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App. 